I know this is not completely consoling to you who's currently swimming in the sea of suffering right now, but the amazing thing is that once you grasp this fundamental attitude, all of your suffering will just fade away, ultimately to a vanishing point. Well, I got this off a of Snapple cap and I'm kind of living by it right now, but suppose I personally succeed in seeing things through your eternal eyes, I mean, then I'll be happier. But don't I have a duty to others? <laughs> you know what? You remind me of the Mahayana Buddhist right now. Oh, awesome. I'm like, I'm like a Buddhist? Well, not in a cool Zen way. Aw. Oh, come on, listen. Each one of them says, I will not enter Nirvana until I first see that all other sentient beings do so. So each one of those guys waits for the other one to go first. No wonder it takes them so long. But the Hinayana Buddhists err in a completely different direction. He believes that no one can be of the slightest help to others in obtaining salvation. Each one has to do it entirely by himself. And so he only works for his own salvation. But this very detached attitude makes salvation impossible. The truth of the matter is that salvation is partly an individual and partly a social process. But it's a huge mistake to believe, as many Mahayana Buddhists do, that the attaining of enlightenment puts one out of commission for helping others. The best way of helping others is by first seeing the light oneself. You see, you can only help others light their torches once your torch has been lit. Okay, there's one thing about your self-description which is just disturbing. You, you described yourself pretty much as a process. And that just puts you in such an impersonal light. And so many people have a need for a, a personal God. So just because they need a personal God, it makes me one? No, of course not. But to be acceptable to a mortal, a religion must satisfy his needs. Hey, I realize that. But the so-called personality of a being is really more in the eyes of the beholder than in the being itself. All the arguments about whether I'm a personal or an impersonal being are just silly because neither side is right or wrong. You know, from one point of view, I am personal. And from another, I'm not. It's the same with the human being. Say, take, you know, a creature from another planet may look at him purely and personally as a, as a mere collection of atomic particles behaving accordingly to strictly prescribed physical laws. He may have no more feeling for the personality of a human as you guys have for ants. But let me tell you something, mister. An ant has just as much individual personality as a human to beings like myself who really know the ant. I mean, to look at something impersonally is no more right or wrong than to look at it personally. But in general, the better you get to know something, the more personal it becomes. So to illustrate my point, do you think of me as a personal or an impersonal being? Well, I'm talking to you, am I not? Exactamundo. From that point of view, your attitude toward me is personal. And yet, from another point of view, which is no less valid, I can also be looked at as impersonally. But if you're really just some crazy process, I don't see what sense it makes in me just talking to a mere process. <laughs> I love the way you say mere. You might just as well say that you're living in a mere universe. Also, why must everything one does make sense? Does it make sense to talk to trees? Oh, absolutely not. But a lot of children and primitives talk to trees. Yeah, but I'm not a child and I'm not a primitive. Unfortunately, I realize that. Why unfortunately? Because many children and primitives have a primal intuition which you have just completely lost. I mean, seriously, it would do a lot of good for you to talk to a tree once in a while. Even more good than talking to me. Now, I'm not saying you gotta join Greenpeace or anything. But look, we're getting sidetracked again. For the last time, I, I would like us to come to an understanding about why I gave you free will. I've been thinking about that the entire time. You mean you haven't even been paying attention to our entire conversation? 
Yes, of, no, of course I have. I yeah, the whole time. But you know, I like also I've been on another level. I've been like thinking, you know, I've been channeling through it. I see. And have you come to a conclusion? Well, you said that the reason was not to test our worthiness, and you also said that the reason was not that we need to feel that we must merit things in order to enjoy them. And you said that you're a utilitarian. And most importantly of all, you were extremely happy when I figured out that it wasn't sinning that was bad, but the suffering that which it causes is. Well, of course, what else could be possibly wrong about sinning? All right, all right, you knew that, and now I understand that, but... You know, all my life, sadly, I've been under the influence of those moralists who hold sinning as to be bad in itself. But, you know, putting all these pieces together, it seems to me that the only reason you gave us free will is because you believe that with free will, people will not hurt each other or themselves as much as without it. Woo! Bravo! That is by far the best reason that you have given me. And I can assure you that had I chosen to give you free will, that right there would be the reason for it. What? You mean you didn't choose to give us free will? My small friend, I could no more choose to give you free will than I could choose to make an equilateral triangle equilangular. I could choose to make or not to make an equilateral triangle in the first place, but having chosen to make one, I would then have no choice but to make it equilangular. What? I, I, I thought you could do anything. Only things which are logically possible. As St. Thomas said, it is a sin to regard the fact that God cannot do the impossible as a limitation on his powers. I agree, except that in place of his using the word sin, I would have used error. Yeah, that's great, God, but I'm still confused that you didn't choose to give us free will. Well, I think it's about time I tell you that this entire discussion from the very beginning has been based on one giant misunderstanding. We've been talking purely on a moral level. You originally complained that I gave you free will and then you asked the question whether I should have. It never occurred to you that I had absolutely no choice in the matter. Yeah, I'm still in the dark here. You bet your bottom dollar you are because you're only able to look at it through the eyes of a moralist. The more fundamental, metaphysical aspects of the question you never even considered. I still do not understand a word you are saying. Well, before, you requested me to remove your free will, but don't you think your first question should have been, do I have free will? Well, I just took that for granted. But why should you? I don't know. Do I have free will? Yes. But then why are you saying I shouldn't have taken it for granted? Because you shouldn't. Just because something happens to be true doesn't mean you have to take it for granted. Anyway, it's reassuring to know that my natural intuition about having free will is correct. I mean, sometimes I've, I've been worried that the determinists are correct. They are correct. Well, wait just a second now. Do I have free will or don't I? I already told you you do, but that doesn't... Prove determinism wrong. Well, are my acts determined by the laws of nature, or aren't they? Okay, the word determined here is extremely misleading. Your acts are certainly in accordance with the laws of nature, but to say that they're determined by the laws of nature creates a totally misleading psychological image, which is that your will could somehow be in conflict with the laws of nature, and that and that it's somehow more powerful than you, and could determine your acts whether you liked it or not. But it is simply impossible for your will to ever conflict with natural law. You and natural law are really two sides of the same coin. What do you mean I can't conflict with nature? What if I really wanted to and I was determined not to obey the laws of nature? What could stop me? I mean, you couldn't even stop me. You know something? You're absolutely right. I wouldn't be able to stop you. Nothing could stop you. And do you know why? Because you would have never even begun. In trying to oppose nature, we are, in the very process of doing so, acting according to the laws of nature. <laughs>